I would like to introduce the Professor Subir Sachdev in a little bit more broader context. Um, so I asked uh, the uh, staff at ACTP to get the CV. And actually, I got the brief CV from Subir Sachdev, uh, which is already very long. And uh, uh, let me just mention a few quite remarkable facts about him. So, so, uh, so he is. I don't think I need to give like full introduction for him because he's already very famous. But the, uh, um, I learned a few things uh, today, and uh, the the thing is that he got like a uh, uh, Europe medal twice, um, and uh, 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 on cyber prizes, and uh, he's a uh, like a. Uh, um, uh, like members of the American Academy of Arts and Science and Indian Academy of Science and uh, like US National Academy of Science. So he's basically the leading figure in the physics community all around the world. And uh, for example, I myself, when I was a graduate student, I grew up reading his book on the current capabilities and uh, his uh, old papers about like anti ferromagnets and the balance bond solids and periphases, they are all like motivating and like intuitive papers. I recommend the students to read. And uh, today I guess he's going to tell us about the uh, SYK models and the quantum statistical mechanics of the black holes. Professor Subir Sachdev, um, um, please start. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Gil, for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you, uh, 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 Kim, uh, for the invit invitation to present this colloquium. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to talk to people in Korea, and I hope uh, next time there will be an opportunity to do it in person. Uh, so as uh, Gil said earlier, uh, please interrupt me anytime. I'm happy to have a discussion, and uh, it's late at night here, so you know we can just have a nice discussion <laughs> in the evening, although I guess it's morning in Korea. Um, Okay, so let me begin uh, by giving you my motivation for the class of models uh, uh, I'm going to describe, uh, just by going back to the foundations of basic solid state physics and uh, statistical physics, which were laid uh, mostly by Boltzmann uh, in the 19th century, even before the discovery of quantum mechanics. <laughs> uh, so one, of course, is the fundamental identification of entropy, which was a thermodynamic quantity before him uh, as a statistical quantity, as a measure of the logarithm of the number of uh, microstates available to any given many body system. Uh, and there's a simple generalization of this to uh, quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, uh, you know, the idea of a quantum state becomes very sharp and there's just a set of energy levels. Um, so you take some small window and you compute the density of many body energy levels, which I'll call capital D of E. Uh, and then there's this connection between the entropy of the quantum system uh, at energy E uh, and the density of states. Okay, so, so that's, that's the basic foundation of how you compute thermodynamic quantities in, uh, in a many body system. But Boltzmann's other great contribution was not about we even talked about dynamics and how to things evolve in time. Uh, and he was addressing the motion of uh, uh, particles, uh, molecules in a dilute gas, like the atmosphere. Uh, and he wrote an equation for the distribution function uh, of these molecules uh, at position R and momentum P. Now, uh, the left-hand side of Boltzmann equation is just a restatement of Newton's laws uh, for this new quantity, the distribution function. Uh, but the new thing that he introduced was the right-hand side, which is the collision term, which describes how when the particles uh, occasionally get together, uh, they scatter. And the big assumption in writing down this collision term for which uh, Boltzmann got a lot of criticism, but he really had it completely right, uh, is that successive collisions are statistically independent. So once two particles collide, uh, then they just lose memory of the previous collision, uh, and you can treat the collision as statistically independent of each other. Uh, and this basically means that the system becomes chaotic 
uh, in a single collision time, mean collision time. So very quickly, system become chaotic and you show the entropy grows uh, and you eventually reach some kind of maximum entropy thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, and the collision term, you know, is written here. It conserves energy and momentum. Uh, and there's some scattering sec cross section T. Uh, and then there's a distribution function of the incoming particles. So it just depends on the product of the distribution function. And that's where the assumption of molecular chaos, chaos comes in. Uh, and then there's also the backwards process just to make sure you preserve time reversal symmetry. Anyway, so the remarkable thing is this was written for a dilute gas uh, with rare collisions, but it holds without hardly any changes uh, in a quantum gas, a dense quantum gas, like electrons in a metal. So electrons in a metal uh, are very dense, uh, and you would naively think that means they're colliding with each other all the time. But if you look at the collision term, the only change you can see from the previous slide and this slide uh, are these one minus F factors. And this is simply a statement of Pauli's exclusion principle, uh, where the outstates must also be empty for the collision to proceed. Um, and so what you see here is that uh, this can be very small because when you're inside, when the Fermi surface, when all particles are occupied, uh, then F is equal to one, and this vanishes because this is zero. And if you're outside, well, there are no particles around, so this vanishes because this is zero. So in any case, it's mostly zero, and collisions are very rare, and only happen in a very narrow energy interval around the Fermi surface. So with this small, small little change, then you can basically apply Boltzmann's picture uh, to how, you know, the thermodynamics of a dense quantum gas, how it uh, moves forward and how particles collide and uh, they're rare. Uh, and you can basically use the idea of a particle uh, uh, even in a dense system. Yeah. The Landau made also the important point that the, there could be certain renormalization on the left-hand side coming from the change in the dispersion and the interaction between the particles, but these are relatively minor uh, terms, they don't basically, they don't modify the basic picture set forth by uh, Boltzmann. Question. So this analysis, yes. So this assumes that interactions are point-like, right? Uh, yeah, okay. This is for short-range interaction, that's correct, but uh, you have screening if you have long-range interactions, and then once you put the screening effects in, the, the same equation still works. Yeah. Uh, right. So, of course, we are going to uh, talk about systems with stronger interactions where the Boltzmann equations are not valid. That's kind of where we are going. Yes. Oh. Okay. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, I was just wondering whether what what happens when you have uh, electrons scattering via photons. I mean, then you would have a I mean, are they screened as well? Uh, uh, well, the longitudinal, yeah, the transverse photon, no, it's not screened. And yeah, then there, there are long range effects and I will be discussing them towards the end of my talk, actually. Okay, thanks. Okay. But in, uh, you know, in metals, uh, you know, the electromagnetic photon effects are, are very weak because they're suppressed by factors of V over C. Uh, and so even though they may ultimately be very important at very, very low energies, it's not of practical importance because the couplings are very weak. Okay. But I'll come back to that towards the end of my talk. And what about phonons, for instance? I mean, what about phonon interactions? Yeah, Maybe... with phonons, uh, you can certainly write down a Boltzmann equation, no problem. You have a distribution function of electrons and a distribution function of phonons, and then it's a very similar looking equation. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this kind of equation has been extremely successful. Uh, so if you take uh, electrons in a metal like copper, uh, it describes what's going on extremely well. Uh, and what you find by solving the Boltzmann equation is that the typical time between electron scattering events 
uh, diverges as temperature goes to zero. So it becomes very long and collisions are rare and it diverges as one over temperature squared. Uh, and as a consequence, if you look at the resistivity of a metal, uh, it goes as the collision rate. Uh, and so it has a connection that goes as T squared, which is definitely obeyed. So, so now you can ask, okay, let's imagine that we make the interaction stronger and stronger. Uh, maybe we change the prefactor here. We turn off some coupling constant, you know, how, until when uh, is this uh, analysis going to be valid? Uh, and you can make a quite a general argument based upon some uh, energy and time uncertainty principle and that will be valid as long as this time tau uh, is longer than this Planck, people now call the Planckian time, which is the time you can build up from Planck's constant and temperature measuring units of energy. So this is our time, and this seems like for Boltzmann theory to be valid, tau must be bigger than uh, h bar over t. Uh, and as long as this is true, the scattering events are rare enough that each individual electron uh, you know, can be thought of as a as a particle. It may have a cloud of renormalization around it, but individual particles are well defined. And so the picture of transport in a metal is that there is a regime at times shorter than tau where things are essentially moving like particles in a ballistic way. Uh, and at long time, uh, the collisions immediately make things chaotic, uh, which is what and that this this Transition from integrable to chaotic is well described by the Boltzmann equation. Okay. Question. So that's a basic summary of all of solid state physics, let's say before the 1980s. Yes. No. So although I listened to Frankian time several times, can you derive can you derive this time scale from something or so I understand you introduced this by uncertainty yeah. principle, but is it derived well, I mean, were... or? Uh, well, uh, no, there's no rigorous definition here, derivation here. Uh, it's just a reasonability argument that uh, when you, if you take a system where the collisions are so strong that quasi particles are not defined, uh, then basically, uh, the only natural time scale that gets left over since uh, uh, there's a certain scale invariant system with the quasi particles not defined, the only time scale left over is h bar over kt. Uh, and the point is that if you make the transition interactions even stronger, there's some reorganization of the ground state and the system goes into some other types of quasi particles. So you have to be in this delicate regime where uh, no, you know, where the original quasi particles are not well defined, but also some new other particles are not well defined also. And, and that pretty much tells you that you have to be at the sweet spot where the time is h bar over kt. Yeah. So, the quantum critical uh, point the correlation lengths, I mean, in a perturbative way of calculation, so the only length scale at the critical point at finite temperature, so you have one over T, that's what, that's what you're saying. Yes, that's one way to say it. I mean, but okay, I see, yeah. so that's a scaling argument for a quantum critical point. But then the question is, why should that be a lower bound? That's a, you know, why should it always be longer than that, even when you're away from the quantum critical point? That's really the, the main point I was making. That you mean if when you move away from the quantum critical point, uh, you might think on one side you're making the interactions much stronger, and so the time should become even shorter. Uh, but however, what happens is that there's a rearrangement of the ground state and you get some other particle. Uh, and if you try to figure out what its collision time, it's always much longer than h bar over kt. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, there was no proof of this bound. It was just a, a very reasonable looking uh, bound, which which could be supported by lots and lots of examples of various systems. And you found it was obeyed in every such system. 
Now, of course, now we have the modern developers in OTOC where there is also some sort of a proof of the bound, uh, but there are holes in that too. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, uh, it would be quite remarkable if anybody found a system which this bound is violated. And so far, I'm not aware of any such system. Okay, so great. Uh, so, all right, so the, so where is this bound violated or almost violated? Well, the most famous example is of course the uh, high temperature superconductors. So my interest here is not so much in the high temperature superconducting phase or the anti-ferromagnetic phase, uh, but this phase over here, which people often call the strange metal, uh, where it's very clear from numerous experiments that Boltzmann theory doesn't work. So if you, uh, uh, for example, if you look at the temperature dependence of the resistivity, uh, it's a linear function of temperature rather than T squared down to very low temperatures. Uh, this is a, this is in a cuprate. This is in twisted bilayer graphene. Here you see very similar behavior. Um, I also want to mention, uh, uh, a recent experiment uh, which actually measured the time tau through angle through something called angle dependent uh, magneto resistance. So I'm not sure I want to go through all the details of the experiment uh, by just they basically measure how the resistance varies as a function of the angle of the magnetic field uh, and then put that into some kind of Boltzmann equation and try to deduce what the time tau is. Uh, and here I just want to show you that if you look at uh, this red line, which is the temperature, they, they have two components uh, to the to the time. Uh, the red component you can think of as coming from impurity, so we just uh, ignore that. Uh, and uh, sorry, the other way around. Uh, the the black component is uh, you view as coming from impurity, so you ignore that. But the red component. Uh, has a temperature dependence, and so that's coming from electron electron interactions. Um, and if you look at that, it turns out to be linear function of temperature. In fact, and the coefficient alpha uh, is very close to one. So it seems to be exactly at the bound uh, where you would expect uh, breakdown, you know, of uh, uh, certainly the quasi particle picture doesn't apply anymore, but there's some other picture, some other uh, metal here, some strange metal, which seems to have at least some uh, internal time scale, which is just given by temperature alone. Okay. Question, what uh, does it mean? What does it mean to coefficient alpha? So is it important? Uh, well, order of one, measure. order of one, yeah. Yeah, they measured this experiment and it's about one point, yeah. Close is to there one. any meaning, a hidden physical meaning? So alpha is the order of one? Well, it's a, it's something the theory should predict. And I'm going to present a theory towards the end of my talk where we'll find alpha is indeed of order one. But this is a, this is an experimental fact that theory should, should now, now try to understand. <clears throat> I okay. see. So Thank I'll you. give you my theory. We'll see. You can judge for yourself, but, but I, I would say it's fair to say there is really, uh, there, uh, there is no theory. Uh, we have some ideas that I will present to you, which are, uh, I think, are in the right track, but you can judge. So what what is the material? Um... Oh, this material, oh gosh, I should know this. Uh, yeah, here it is, NDLSCO, neodymium lanthanum strontium copper oxide. Is it, oh, and it has a magnetic field applied. Um, it, what... Yes, you have applied 45 Tesla here. Uh, and then you change the angle of the field. Yeah. Uh, was that crucial? Um, I'm a little bit confused why they have to put magnetic field on. Well, they, um, first of all, you have to destroy the superconductivity. Oh, I see. And secondly, they're measuring magneto resistance. So it's the okay. oh, angle depend dependence of the resistance on the angle of the magnetic field that allows them to really uh, disentangle the impurity scattering and the inelastic scattering. Otherwise, it's they're just combined together. It's not easy to measure them absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, there's a lot of analysis in this paper on how things depend on angle at different fields and they follow all that evolution. And at the end of the analysis, you get these results here. Okay, so, so to describe this strange metal, uh, you know, we need to go beyond the boltzmann landau quasi particle description. Uh, and, and basically the fundamental assumption of Boltzmann and Landau is that successive collisions are independent and in quantum mechanics, it means there's no interference between successive collisions. But now we have to put that interference back in uh, and really, in other words, treat many particle quantum entanglement in a serious way. Okay, so let me then introduce the toy model called the SYK model, uh, which allows you to at least have an example of a system in which uh, you're very you're the, uh, very far from Boltzmann's picture and you really have a large number of particles all entangled with each other. Uh, once you have such an example, then you can you know study it and try to use some gain some insights for something more realistic. So just to give a very elementary introduction, you know, what is entanglement? Well, entanglement is, uh, I guess, an idea in this famous EPR paper. If you imagine you take a, a pair of electrons, which are, whose spin is in, in this up, down, minus down, up configuration, and you separate them, uh, then EPR pointed out that if you make the separation without disturbing the spin, uh, you would still have some non-trivial quantum correlation between them. Uh, that is, if you measure this particle to be down, then the other one, no matter how far away, uh, is up. And uh, so the two particles, even though physically separated, share uh, a quantum state. Uh, and so the measurement of one particle is really, in effect, a measurement of the other one, too. Uh, okay, so the, the, that's the very bizarre non-local feature of quantum mechanics that uh, Einstein, it is said, leads to spooky action at a distance. And I always wonder, did he actually say that? And the answer is yes, he did say that. Uh, this is a letter that he wrote to Max Born in 1947. Uh, this is in German and the, <laughs> and the English translation is here indeed talking about spooky action at a distance. And he, he says here, I cannot seriously believe in, in it, meaning quantum mechanics, because the theory cannot be reconciled with the idea that physics should represent a reality in time and space, free from spooky action at a distance. Um, well, the theory is local, uh, but the idea of a quantum state is not local. I think that's how we understand it today. Uh, in fact, many, you know, so that was two particle entanglement. Uh, if you go back in history, there is Kekule who came up with a structure of benzene molecule uh, in a modern language was really talking about uh, six particle entanglement. So in benzene, you have uh, electrons that form, let's say these valence bonds uh, in this configuration. Uh, and so now these two electrons are entangled and that's entangled and that's entangled. Uh, but the actual configuration is a resonance between them. Uh, this idea of resonance is due to Kekulé, and now you have a uh, entanglement uh, if the, the quantum description, which wasn't known to Kekulé. Uh, you have six entangled electrons, uh, and uh, this is something you find in Wikipedia that he came up with this idea, thinking of a you know, snake seizing on its own tail. So that made me think of, uh, you know, what dream did I have? Uh, so this is my spooky dream based on this ancient Indian game of snakes and ladders, uh, where you can be bitten by a snake and go from anywhere to anywhere. Uh, then you have to go back up again. Uh, and uh, so now there's entanglement, if you wish, uh, between every site and every other site. Uh, and that, in a nutshell, is in fact what the SYK model is. So it's a model of multi-particle entanglement, which accounts for quantum interference between successive collisions. So, um, so let me now describe really the model. Did you really dream that? Uh, did you look at the app? Oh, okay. Here? <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, this game I, I discovered later when, when I came to uh, 
the US, uh, in England, uh, this game went to England from India. In, in England, they call it shoots and ladders. They I didn't see. like the idea of having snakes. Uh, they have this shoots and ladders and all anyway. But this is the original game. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Interesting story, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, so what is the SYK model? Uh, it's like that game. You take a bunch of uh, sites. They're not necessarily on a square, but on some any arbitrary position. So here's 19 sites, and then you occupy them with some electrons or some fermions, really. Uh, and then you allow them to move and entangle with each other. Uh, so, for example, there's a process where uh, you can electrons on site 11 and 12 move to the empty sites 5 and 14. And in quantum mechanics, any such process is associated with an amplitude. So there's some number, u, associated with this process, which I just labeled here. Uh, and so that can happen. And then that goes on. You pick any two sites, and this is for simplicity. Uh, uh, you allow them to, any two sites to move any other site, and for each such uh, process, you have another number. So in the end, to fully specify the model, uh, you have to give me of order n to the fourth numbers, uh, and then compute something accounting for the interference uh, between all of these processes. These are these can all happen; they happen in parallel, and you get some many-body state. Uh, which is, you know, in the end, takes you as far away as you can be from uh, Boltzmann pictures of just uh, rare collisions between particles. All right, so so that's the Hamiltonian. Uh, here it is written in second quantized form. Uh, you have fermions on, uh, and then this U alpha, beta, gamma, delta are a set of numbers. So so this is the basic problem. It's, completely fully defined by these mathematical relations. Uh, uh, there's also the number of fermions is conserved. And so there's a charge density Q between zero and one, which commutes with the Hamiltonian. Okay, now this problem is essentially unsolvable uh, when N becomes large, even on a computer, you cannot solve it for N bigger than say 30. Uh, but we'd really like to know what this does when n becomes much, much larger than 30. Uh, and nobody knows how to do that uh, because the number of states here is two to the n, which is exponentially large. However, if you make the simple assumption for large n uh, that these numbers u are all statistically independent of each other, uh, then you can solve it in the limit of large n. And in fact, an important point to make is that you solve it for a given realization of u. You, you know, you don't need to average over anything. You're just solving a, a one specific, uh, completely well-defined Hamiltonian. Uh, and in fact, almost all such Hamiltonians are very similar to each other, uh, unless there's some very special set of u that you pick. Uh, then with probability one. Uh, you're going to get the average behavior. So the system is self-averaging in the limit of large n. In fact, self-averaging better than almost any other system you may have seen before. Oh, there was a question? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. Okay, yeah, um, I have a simple question. Uh, would correlations in the uh, coefficients you uh, matter? So you assume them uncorrelated and random. Uh, yes. What happens if yeah. they're correlated? Yeah. Well, I don't think we know. Uh, they could be correlated. Uh, and uh, it's in principle, you could get other states. Uh, you know, you could get some kind of gap. You get superconducting states as possible if you have a very special set of view. Uh, but in general, it's not known. I mean, people... People have done uh, things like dilution, where you make a lot of these mm -hmm. U's exactly equal to zero. And that doesn't seem to change anything. They still seem to have the same same basic property. Yeah. Okay, and what about, uh, again, um, I presume even if they're independent, um, I think the most common case is where you just take them Gaussian distributed. Yes, uh, but, but that's not crucial actually. It doesn't matter. The only the second moment uh, matters. So. So yeah, sure, I take this to have the second. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but that's precisely go, what I want yeah, to so ask. The, what happens if you go to the levy distributions? It, it doesn't change anything. It's still the same. The answer is the same. It only depends okay. on the second moment. So there's kind okay. of like a central limit phenomenon here. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right, so how do you solve this? Well, the simplest way to solve this is to just do perturbation theory in U and average uh, you know, the graphs order by order. And that's not the way we did it, but that's the simplest way to do it if you're uh, with the benefit of hindsight. And then you can write down a Green's function for the electrons, uh, which is the same on every side. It's a local Green's function, only depends on frequency. And there's a self energy and the self energy sigma is just given by this very simple equation. So this is the only Feynman graph that survives the large end limit. The important point being that these are fully renormalized Green's functions. Okay, so you know we wrote these equations down in 1993, uh, and when I first wrote them down, I said, "Well, we'll just solve this in a few uh, in a few days. This looks simple enough." But uh, that's certainly not the case. We're still learning new things about these equations, uh, and as we'll see, just hiding in these very innocuous-looking equations are uh, you know, uh, basics of uh, some very simple types of quantum gravity. Uh, okay, we'll get to that shortly. Uh, the other thing you can try to do now, so you, so you can solve these equations then in the low energy limit and at low temperatures. So you can solve them. Uh, and this was done initially by us in this paper. And then there was uh, important work by George and Parkolet doing it at finite temperature. Uh, and when the dust settles, this is the main answer right here, the Green's function. I put a star on it because it's the low energy limit, uh, has this form. Uh, and this structure here will look very familiar to people who know a little bit about conformal field theory. Uh, this seems to tell you that there is a, you know, some kind of conformal invariance here in this model, which had only random couplings. But if you look at the low energy Green's function, uh, it seems to have some conformal structure and time. Uh, furthermore, if you plot uh, the uh, the Green's function, function of frequency, so you, know, you you see this rather broad spectral functions. And the most important point here is that the width of this, which is some measure of some dissipative relaxation on time of the system, doesn't depend on you. It doesn't depend on the strength of the interactions but it depends on this Planckian uh, time or the inverse of the Planckian time. The width is the inverse of the Planckian time. And, and that simply comes out of this conformal structure uh, in the Green's function. So that seems to be telling you that quasi-particle pictures are broken down, uh, but it doesn't prove it because it could be that there are some other excitation, some other particle, not an electron, but something else which can act like an electron and the only reason you're not seeing it in the spectrum is because you're not, you're averaging over many of the other particles. So, so yeah, anyway. So that's not the case, but uh, that, you know, that, so there's not a proof. So to prove it, you really have to do a, a somewhat more subtle analysis. Uh, and in fact, that comes out of just looking at the thermodynamics a little more carefully. Did somebody have a question? Okay, so let's just take this uh, Hamiltonian, which I wrote down for you, and compute the partition function at a fixed charge Q. And then from this, you can read off the entropy. And then you can rewrite this in terms of uh, Laplace transform of the density of states. So this is a more precise formula here. If I just determine all the eigen energies of this many body system, EI, then the density of states is a series of delta functions at the energy EI. Uh, and then when I put this in the definition of the partition function, I would get this expression here. Uh, now, of course, we are never going to be able to determine every EI. Uh, that's just an impossible task. There's two to the n uh, values, and the values of the EI depends on all the U alpha, beta, gamma, delta. You have to know every one of them, which we don't. So what, what we are going to determine, however, uh, is z of t. This this quantity is perfectly well defined in the larger limit. Uh, 
Uh, and that effectively means that we're going to coarse grain the density of states a little bit over the energy level space. All right, so this, so we did, so the first calculation of this was done in uh, uh, in this paper in 2001 with uh, George and Parcolet. And we found a rather remarkable result. What we found was that the entropy density, the entropy uh, per particle, so you first ascend n to infinity and then take the zero temperature limit, was a non-zero number. It was S0. And this is this number that, in fact, we now we understand quite well is a completely universal number. It only depends uh, at q equals one half. It's always this, independent of what the use or if you put additional interactions in the system. So, so now suppose I just take this temperature independent entropy and put it back in this formula, uh, then you would conclude that the D of E uh, is a delta function of the ground state and with an exponentially large uh, factor in front. So this tells you, seems to say that there's a huge degeneracy in the ground state. Uh, a temperature independent S0 would certainly mean that. Uh, okay, so is that really true? I mean, that sounds very bizarre. I mean, this just doesn't make any sense if you think about it. I mean, there's some things, you know, very special classical models have uh, degenerate ground states and a zero temperature entropy or a ground state entropy, but this is a zero temperature entropy and uh, it's a little more subtle what this means. Um, okay. There is a question, so, yeah. Yes. Uh, can you remind us what is the physical meaning of the Q there? This one half? Oh, the Q is at the charge density. Uh, it's right here. Q is that. Oh, okay, it's just a okay. density. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So Q is between zero and one. I take the particle hole symmetric point, which is how not. But we have, we know the answer for every any Q. But that's the most interesting regime, Q equals one half. And so why is it the most interesting in regime to Q one half? Well, if when Q becomes close to zero, then you're kind of dilute. And uh, there, uh, yeah, you get very similar behavior, but there's also a possibility of a first order transition and phase separation, which actually does happen at very small Q. But that requires numerical uh, analysis to see that, yeah. And the but Q the Q kind of state I'm talking about, this, this conformal state I'm talking about is stable in a window around Q equals one half. And Q equals one is just some fully filled... so full state, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a particle hole transformation. You can take up the model with okay. Q less than a half to Q yeah. bigger than a half. Yeah. They're the same. So, I, um, can I ask about the so you have some fermions, but um, how important was that? Like, how about like as if you replace that with ising spins, is the result change? Uh, it does. Uh, so we looked at the boson case, and now you get a spin glass ground state, and this is not a spin glass state. This is a. Uh, it's like a, this is really a quantum liquid. Uh, it's really the opposite of a spin glass. So for the um, quantum spin um, spin a version of this. Um, am I right that it's qualitatively um, similar to the classical spin glass? So it's important yes, that... Yes, yes, correct. Thank you. A question. So can I have yeah, some yes. physical intuition on finite entropy? Like yes, I'm going to give that to you just now. Okay, I see. Okay, yes, thank sir. you. That is the next... All right, so let's, you know, so let's go to the computer uh, and uh, our, oh no, what what is, okay. Yeah, okay, so let me show you. So now, so this was the behavior, sorry, let me go back here. This was the behavior as T goes to zero. So then you, get, you can go back and do an analysis and this was done relatively recently through methods I'll introduce shortly uh, to what happens to the entropy uh, at small, but not exactly zero temperature. So when you do that calculation, you find that there's a correction. Uh, it vanishes linearly with temperature. So the behavior of the entropy at large N or S over N is S zero plus gamma T. 
So the gamma T is very similar to what happens in a Fermi liquid, uh, except the Fermi liquid, of course, has S0 equals zero. All right, now given this, now you plug this into all these formulae and you figure out what is D of E. This is basically equivalent of going from canonical to microcanonical ensemble. So the entropy is linear in temperature that tells you that the energy is a quadratic function of temperature. Uh, and therefore you'll just replace the entropy by the energy. And then you get the D of E, which is E to the S of E is this. So this just implies that by just undergraduate thermodynamics and N as zero plus square root of two N gamma E. Here E is of order N. And so the everything is of order N and the exponent, uh, just like the entropy is also of order N. Uh, so this is what you, you get, so density of states. All right, so so that's not, there's no delta function, it seems. It just seems to be a smooth function. And if you look at the numerics, that's indeed the case. Uh, these are all the energy levels for a system of size 16 or something. Uh, and they've been binned a little bit. So if you just look at the envelope uh, of the density of states, it's a smooth function, and in fact, it's just given by this this thing down here. All right, but that's you know for this is valid for when the energy is of uh, of order n, uh, and the fact that the, the entropy is exponential uh, linear in n, and the density of states is exponential in n is, a, is true for any system. There's no surprise. The question really is what happens to this as e goes to zero? How far in energy uh, does this result still hold? So if you go down to very low energy, which is down here, then what we're going to see, uh, in fact, this, this in fact does hold. Uh, uh, we now know from numerics and also calculations, this holds all the way down essentially down to zero energy. And therefore this term is still there. And what you see from the numerics is that it's not because of any degeneracy, it's because the energy levels are very close to each other. It's e to the minus n s naught. Uh, and so you have a very dense set of levels uh, at very close to the ground state. And this is essentially tells you that there are no quasi particles. So if you had a system with quasi particles, then you have a ground state. The first excited state is when you move a particle, you know, from inside the Fermi surface to the outside the Fermi surface. And that's it. So the the ground state is very similar to the first excited state or the second excited state because just moving a few particles around. Uh, and uh, and then the energy level spacing, in fact, is of order one over n, not of order e to the minus n. Here, if you look at all of these states, they're completely different from each other. They're changing chaotically from one state to the next. Uh, and they just accidentally happen to have energies very close to each other. Uh, so that's really the, in the fact that you have this dense set of levels down to the ground state that essentially proves that there are no quasi particles. Can I ask a question? All right. So now, yes. So for the SYK model, uh, I can see that the, uh, like, I understand what you're trying to say, like, the uh, zero temperature and finite entropy can be, uh, implies that there is no, like, quasi particles. But the uh, for the non-formal liquids, do I generally expect to see the like zero temperature, non-zero entropy? Oh uh, no. Or no, is don't. it the particular? Okay. Uh -huh. So it's a particular uh, class sure. of the. This is for zero-dimensional models. So mm -hmm. basically, what this means is that uh, this, if you have a non-zero entropy, that's a sufficient condition for existence of quasi-particle. It's mm -hmm. not a necessary condition. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about examples soon, hopefully by the end of my talk. Uh, I'm getting a lot of questions. So I now see that actually, I don't have that much time. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, we will see examples where in fact, the entropy does vanish, but you still don't have quasi particles. Yeah. Now, what uh, happens more... with a finite system of a non fermi liquid in higher dimensions is actually not very well understood as to what happens to the entropy down here. Yeah. Uh, one more follow-up yes. question. Yes. What happens in the yes. multi-channel condo? Similar thing happens? No, no, multi-channel condo. This does not happen. So uh, the origin for finite entropy is different in the SYK. 
Yes, I mean, the, the, this, the, all of this physics has to do, is not present in the multi-channel condo problem. Uh, I see. Multi-channel condo, you are, I mean, there is something called a boundary entropy, but that, that's just a number of order one. Uh, here, the entropy is of order n, where n is the size of the system. There's no n there. I see. But in the, you can calculate in large n, large m limit in the multi-channel condo. Uh, yes, you can. Correct. I mean, the calculations, in fact, have some similarities. Uh, but if you look at the energy level spacing in a finite box, they're still of order one over L. Oh, I see. They're not of order E to the minus L. Oh, I see. Mm. Okay. All right. So now what we want to do is I'll just fly, relatively quickly go through the theory of how uh, to, to get, you know, the full form of this formula down to very low energies. This is certainly valid when E is of order N, but we'd like to know what happens when E is of order one, or even when E is of order one over N, or maybe even E is of order E to the minus N. Uh, let's see how far we can go. Okay. So, so to do this, we have to really look at uh, the part average partition function uh, beyond uh, the saddle point. Uh, and the way this works is you start with the Hamiltonian and wrote down, you average over the couplings, uh, you do various Hubbard Chernovich transformations, uh, and then you can rewrite the partition function in this way. I mean, uh, George Parker and I had, I mean, already in my first paper with Jingu, we had uh, something like this, uh, not exactly this form. Uh, and the important point is this partition function is a partition function of you know just two fields, G and sigma, which depends on two times, tau one and tau two. So you've gone from a, a path integral over n fields to a path integral over two bilocal fields. And this is the action. Uh, and when you take the saddle point to the large n limit, uh, you, you produce the equations that we had in 93. And now the saddle point of this only depends on the time differences. And this is now becomes the Green's function and the self-energy, which is why we call them G and sigma. But they're really only the physical Green's function at the saddle points. Here you have to do a full path integral over G and sigma. Okay, so this is the saddle point and we'd like to do the full path integral. Now that turns out to be, you know, that's impossible. Nobody, we still don't know how to do that. But this action turns out to have a, a very important symmetry, which is in fact behind the conformal structure that I talked about earlier. So what you find is a suppose now, when you do the analysis of this to get the low energy equations uh, solution that uh, I did with Jingu in 93, uh, it turns out that this, this I omega plus mu term makes no difference. The mu gets canceled and the omega term is not as important at low frequency. So this means that this term here is also not important. Now, if I drop this term in this action, then the remaining term have a huge amount of symmetry. In particular, you, it's quite easy to show that the remaining terms are invariant under time reparameterization. So you reparameterize tau to some other time sigma uh, with arbitrary function f, which has to be monotonic and periodic. We are, other than that, it's uh, just arbitrary. It's just a function from a circle to a circle. Uh, and then you put in these factors and you get a new Green's function as a function in the new uh, frame, sigma one, sigma two, then the action for this G is the same as the action for that G. And similarly, there's also an emergent gauge symmetry. So however, these are symmetries of the action if and only if you ignore this term, but that term is there. So that, but it's not important. We know it at low energies, it's not as important. So this tells us that there is a very softly broken time reparameterization and gauge symmetry. And if you want to only take the strongest fluctuations, you should really take advantage of this, uh, this zero mode. So in practice, what this means is you, you take your conformal Green's function, G star, I told you earlier, and then you perform a, a time reparameterization of that. So this, 
you know, sort of like a spin wave deformation in a nonlinear signal model, this will take you along a flat direction. And the only reason it's not flat uh, is because of the time derivative term uh, that I mentioned earlier. So by that, you know, you can rewrite this partition function. Now we can make even a further simplification. This partition function, which is an integral over G and sigma of two times. So this is, a, we can now reduce it at low energies uh, to a partition function over F, which is a function of only one time, and phi, which is a function of only one time, with some effective action. And now the hard part is to determine this action. Uh, so that's been done by various people. Uh, and uh, essentially you can't figure it out, but you use certain symmetry argument to understand the general structure of it. So from the symmetry argument, uh, you know, I'll just flash the answer. Uh, this is what uh, action looks like. This is like a rotor variable that's relatively easy. That's the easy part that we did. Uh, but then this is the more subtle part, which is written down by Kitab and Maldasena and Yang in Stanford. Uh, so this is what's called the Schwarzschild um, of this uh, function f of tau. Uh, here's what it looks like. So that follows from a certain SL2R symmetry, uh, which is the conformal symmetry in zero plus one dimensions. Uh, and then you have to mod out by the volume of the SL2R group. And once you do that, in fact, this action is finite. This path, path integral is completely doable. And in fact, it can be done exactly. So, so that's, there's a long story there with a lot of brilliant work uh, uh, by various string theorists, essentially, and Kitaev. And when the dust settles, what you end up is a, is a correction to this term. So this is what I told you the entropy looks like. And this is the density of states that we just found from much more pedestrian arguments. Uh, if you do the full path integral, you get a correction. So what is the correction? So this, all that work is to get this result out here. Uh, so this is the leading term, which you still have. And now you get the corrections. So this correction um, has a minus three halves log of one over temperature. Uh, that comes from the Schwarzschild. Uh, and there's also log n terms, uh, which is rather subtle, and I won't go into it. Uh, and then they have one over n corrections. So this is what you get for the entropy. So once you know the entropy, you know you know the partition function, and so you have to do inverse Laplace transform to get D of E. And amazingly, that can be done exactly for because of this three halves, in fact. And this is the final answer for the density of states. So this has various terms in here. This term was obtained by us already. That's the S naught term. Uh, this comes from the short chain path integral, probably first by Steve Schenker et al. and Kotler et al. And this one over n factor is related to this log n. Uh, that's something that we got uh, relatively recently. It's not as important. So finally, I can take this expression here uh, and see what's going on in this plot. So this was the thermodynamic answer. When, and now this is a cinch. So the cinch becomes e to the square root of two n gamma e when, when this is much larger than one. So it goes over to that. Uh, and then right at the uh, bottom of the band, the cinch becomes a square root of e. And so there's a, like a square root edge at the bottom of the band. Uh, but it seems like you know this thing is valid all the way down to zero energy. And like I've said, so this so this confirms that there's exponentially large degeneracy, but no degeneracy, but exponentially large space, level spacing, and there's some chaotic set of wave functions down here. Uh, okay, so as we're going to see that this these very chaotic levels are now. Uh, a toy model for the microstates of a black hole. And I'm going to show you how that happens. That's the next topic I'm going to address. Question. All right. Yes. So, uh, I mean, this is just a minor point, but I suppose uh, this uh, root over two gamma uh, e over get by uh, incorporating the n inverse in, as well. I mean, because a cinch would just give you yes. two n. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. Who yeah. So the the one over n is rather subtle, and uh, I don't want to go into where that one over n comes from. Yeah. It's, and and yeah. Uh, does this also mean that uh, this kind of ameliorates the uh, uh, the entropy because I mean when you go to energy goes to, as energy goes to zero, this extra yeah. term to the zero uh, zero and makes it makes the digit go to zero. Is that right? Yeah, but in the end, it's only multi. You know, this is some power laws multiplying something that's exponentially large, so it doesn't really make much of a difference. Of course, for small n, it would, but. When n is large, the important thing is an exponentially large factor. This is just a power law. It doesn't matter as much. No, that's true. But at exactly at energy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So when you know when when your energy is exponentially small, uh, only then will this become comparable to that. And when your energy is exponentially small, you have discrete levels. So if at that point you can't use this formula because if you really care about every level, then uh, then you can't use thermodynamics. Uh, okay, somebody needs to mute themselves. <laughs> All right, so let's go to black. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, you can go. Yeah. All right, so what's a black hole? So I presume you all heard about black holes. There are solutions of Einstein's theory of gravity. Uh, and so there's a region of space which has a mass m, uh, but it's completely trapped in there, uh, inside this horizon. And uh, outside the horizon, or even near the horizon, it's just empty space. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's related to the mass inside the black hole by this uh, famous formula of Schwarzschild. OK. Uh, but now we're interested in quantum black holes. What happens in quantum mechanics? Well, you can imagine doing the EPR experiment, but across a black hole horizon. Uh, and quantum mechanics would say, since there's nothing really, there's no matter, there's nothing really happening at the black hole horizon. So this can, this kind of experiment can proceed uh, without any trouble. Uh, and so there should be entanglement between the inside and outside of a black hole. And so if you're outside the black hole, uh, you have no way of knowing, uh, at least you know, in a reasonable time, what the state of the other uh, uh, qubit inside the black hole is. And so to you, even in principle, this is just a random qubit. Uh, and so, so roughly speaking, you can imagine uh, by Boltzmann's idea, if you have random qubits, then you have an entropy and a temperature. So quantum mechanics seems to say that you have uh, black holes actually have a temperature and an entropy. And indeed that's correct. And Hawking in 1975 uh, actually gave numbers for those quantities. So I'm going to now describe uh, a slightly later calculation by Gibbons and Hawking uh, of uh, of that uh, black hole entropy. So this is the, the what you do. You start out with the theory of Einstein gravity. Now I'm going to consider uh, black holes with the charge Q for reasons that will become clear in a few minutes. Uh, then you also have to worry about the electromagnetic field. So that's you take the Einstein uh, theory of Einstein and Maxwell. Uh, the, the action was known in the 19th century. And then Feynman tells us you just do the path integral uh, with a one over h bar front in here of the classical action. Uh, and furthermore, we're going to work at get the partition function, not the time evolution operator. And for the partition function, you do it in imaginary time. All right, so we want to do this path integral uh, about the saddle point of a black hole. Now, if you take a black hole in imaginary time, uh, you find its metric, the virtual metric looks something like this. Famous metric has the form of a cigar, where uh, this is time, and the time runs in circle. And another thing you know from the Feynman prescription that the uh, length of the time circle is just h bar over temperature. Okay. And then this direction here is the direction, radial direction outside the black hole. 
uh, and the angular direction is not shown. So every point on the surface of the cigar is the angular direction. But the remarkable thing about this this, uh, this geometry is that it basically ends at the horizon. So this is great because you you know you're sitting outside the black hole where it's just empty space. You don't even need to know what's inside the black hole. You don't need to know anything about it. Uh, you just have empty space, uh, and you just have to evaluate in this empty space, uh, which is closes off at the horizon, uh, this partition function. So what uh, Einstein and Maxwell, well, sorry, what Gibbons and Hawking did, they said, well, there's a one over h bar here, so let's just take, which is like a large n, so let's just take the saddle point. Let's take the Einstein action for a black hole and evaluate it in this uh, imaginary time geometry and see what you get. Okay, so when you do that, you in fact get uh, the famous result of uh, Hawking. Uh, and back in time. So you find that the, the back, the end, they get an entropy, which is equal to the area of the horizon, which is A of T. Uh, and T is this, this length scale here. And it is also related to various, well, I'll tell you what, uh, your T is related to the mass of the black hole in a way that I have not written down. But we'll think of the independent quantities as temperature and charge, not mass and charge. Okay, so in terms of the temperature and charge, there's some area uh, and uh, and that gives you the uh, entropy. Now you can look at the zero temperature limit and then you find that there's a constant plus a term linear in T. This is just comes from uh, solving Einstein's equations and evaluating the saddle point action as shown by Gibbons and Hawking. And and this area, this A zero is the area of the horizon at zero temperature, just related to the charge. So this is why I need a charge because if you didn't have a charge, you can't really take a zero temperature limit. But a charged black hole does have a stable a zero temperature limit this way. Okay, so we've done something. You know, we got a kind of a very bizarre result. We've, there's no Hamiltonian. We don't even know what the degrees of freedom are. Uh, whatever they are, presumably they're inside the black hole. But just by sitting outside the black hole and doing this imaginary time path integral without knowing that there's a Hamiltonian, we have got this entropy. Uh, so, you know, so there was a lot of skepticism. Of course, we now know that uh, Bekenstein and Hawking got it completely right. Uh, but we'd like to find, uh, you know, some simple Hamiltonian that has the, the same behavior, uh, which then could be a, like a quantum simulation, then at least of a, of a black hole. Okay, so now I've, I'd like you to notice that this constant plus a lit term linear in T is exactly what we just saw in the larger limit of the SYK model. Uh, and there are also many other similarities, which in fact I noted in this PRL in 2010, uh, but nobody seemed to have read that paper until five years later when Kitev uh, actually made this much sharper. Okay, but the basic idea was already here in 2010. Um, all right, so and it came from just looking at all these uh, circumstantial evidence of similarities between the thermodynamics of a black hole and various response functions of a black hole uh, and, and the SYK model. Actually, another very important factor, which I also discussed here, uh, was the was the response to perturbations. So uh, as we show, I showed you, there was a a Planckian time uh, relaxation of the SYK model. Similarly, if you take Einstein's equations and you imagine you throw in a star into the black hole and you ask how long does it take before it relaxes to thermal equilibrium in a slightly larger shape, the time it takes is the Planckian time. Uh, and that was really the most uh, striking similarity uh, that led me to imagine that there could be a, a connection between these two systems. All right, so let me make that connection more precise. So what is the key to this? Well, the key to this is to understanding where, what is the origin of the linear T term, uh, even in this theory. So now let's actually look at the solution of the Einstein gravity uh, uh, model. And, and, and if you solve it, you find that the metric has a rather strange form. If you're very far from the horizon, this is the radial direction zeta, 
that I'm plotting. Uh, then very far from the horizon, the space time is four dimensional. Uh, it could even be Minkowski. But as you get close to the horizon, you find that the space time factorizes. There's an angular part, which is this S2. And then the radial coordinates, zeta and time, form this two dimensional space called ADS2. Uh, so this is a highly symmetric state, which in fact has uh, uh, isometry group, which is the same as the conformal group. Uh, and, and so as a result, if you now try to look at the low energy theory of this black hole, in the low energy limit, you can ignore the S2 and just focus on the ADS2 part. Uh, and so then you can just take Einstein's action and look at the low energy limit of Einstein's action on ADS2. Okay, so this is what you have to do. So this is the full Einstein gravity, which you can solve and get the entropy as a function of temperature. If you take the low energy limit of it near the horizon of a black hole, you get a two-dimensional gravity. Uh, and that turns out to be what's called JT gravity. You also have to worry about the boundary of it uh, because pure 2D gravity is kind of trivial. You can gauge almost everything away. Uh, and the boundary is basically the boundary between the two-dimensional space-time and the four-dimensional space-time. Uh, and in this theory, if you just solve this theory, you will get the linear term exactly right. Uh, if you want to get all the other terms, then you have to go back to the higher dimensional theory. But if you're satisfied by just looking at the constant plus linear T term, you can work in two dimensions. All right, so now you have some low energy JT gravity theory, and then you play around with it and look at it, uh, simplify it because of the special features of simplifying features of two dimensional gravity. Uh, then you find that this is exactly equivalent to the same effective action that I wrote down for the SYK model uh, as a function of time reparameterization f of tau and phi of tau. And now this time reparameterization f of tau uh, represents the fluctuation of this boundary graviton. The f of tau is describing uh, the fluctuation of the boundary uh, between the two-dimensional space-time and the four-dimensional space-time. All right, so you have this remarkable precise connection then, which you can derive. In other words, you can derive this action in two ways, and I've outlined both of them for you. One way is to start from the SYK model and do the G sigma uh, low energy limit. The other, which can be completely explicit with all numbers that you can determine, you just start from Einstein gravity and take its low energy limit, and you get exactly the same action. All right, so now that you have the same action, you can do the path integral. You already did it. So this is going to tell us more about the eigenstates of a black hole. Uh, and the fact that it's the same as the SYK model also gives us, you know, is uh, evidence that in fact, the, Beck the Beckenstein Hawking entropy can be realized in a completely uh, very simple Hamiltonian system, uh, which presumably is describing the degrees of freedom inside the black hole. Okay, so if you take, so I told you earlier that there was a minus three half log T, so this is, you get the same thing here. Then there's, I told you about the log N correction. So here there's a log area correction, and this is a bit more complicated. Here you really have to know something about uh, the structure of gravity in higher dimensions. Uh, this was looked at earlier by Ashok Sen and uh, has been re-examined recently in a very nice paper by Ilyas Yumulti and Turiyachi, who showed that uh, once you account for this short, this uh, this uh, JT gravity theory, there's in fact some corrections to the prefactor. Anyway, so now you can, you have the entropy, you can now invert it and get the density of states. So, so what we then, you know, to answer this question, is there a quantum simulation of the inside of a black hole, some Hamiltonian of a quantum system uh, whose entropy equals what we computed from outside? And the answer is yes. Uh, it's something like the SYK model apart from this prefactor. Uh, so you can invert that answer. And so this tells you what the density of states is. If there's a cinch square root of energy. You know all the constants in here. This is the, Beckenstein Hawking answer. This is what comes from the ADS2 gravity, and the and this prefactor again is uh, 
more subtle as not and is not the same as a SYK model. But what you do learn is that this density of states, uh, you know, has the same form, and therefore the actual energy levels are also exponentially dense and very chaotic down to the ground state. And, and that's believed to be, you know, a robust and generic feature of, of black hole uh, uh, microstates. This is what they look, this is a toy model of my black hole microstates. Now, I should say there have been, you know, many earlier computations of uh, black hole entropy from quantum systems, most famously in string theory. But uh, all of them uh, have supersymmetry at low energies and also looking only at charged black holes. Uh, and what you find from those calculations, what was really thought to be, uh, you know, more generic, in fact, there, there is a delta function at zero energy. And there is a huge degeneracy of states. Uh, uh, and that comes, and these are the BPS states. But this relies crucially on supersymmetry. Uh, the more generic situation is what you get from the SYK model. Uh, there is no degeneracy. There is no energy gap. There's just a continuum of levels. Anyway, so of course, there's been a huge amount of work on uh, looking at these low dimensional models of black holes uh, for many other properties uh, instead of the other than just the density of state. That's kind of where it started. Uh, in particular, people have looked at uh, you know, black hole entanglement entropy and computing the page curve of uh, evaporating black holes. And there's been a lot of success in that direction, uh, starting with uh, Saad Schenker and Stanford identifying these wormholes, uh, which are exponentially small uh, in uh, one of our G terms uh, that become very important in computing the entanglement entropy. But that's a whole topic that I won't uh, obviously go into. Okay, that's really all I have to say about black holes. Uh, what time is it? Uh, where's my clock? I don't see it. It's, uh, um, yeah, um, yeah, it's 11 13, so you have like 15 minutes each for the official time. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. All right, so now I want to, so what I've shown you is that, you know, in oh, 93, we were thinking about, uh, yeah, go oh, ahead. Uh, so in the previous page, in, in various configurations of geometry, I mean, so if I calculate some, some not disk geometry, I mean, if I calculate some SYK cal model calculation, so what is the interpretation in, in quantum field theory interpretation for that gravity calculation? Can I have some intuition? What does it mean in field theory calculation for various type of geometry term at blah, 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 yeah. What? I am not sure I understood your question. Uh, yeah, my question is- so the SYK so, model, you know, so I'm, let me just give you my one quick mm -hmm. point. So in, when you're doing the path integral of SYK, you have this, time parameterization soft mode. That is the Green's function goes from G star to the full Green's function. Uh, and the dominant low energy mode is this F of tau, okay? This is like a local, uh, you know, uh, a local rescaling of time. And that seems to be the dominant low energy mode of, uh, of the SYK model. And this fluctuation of F of tau that tells you you know, uh, that gives you all these states at very low energy. It tells you, it gives you the cinch density, the cinch form uh, comes from that F of tau. So okay, that's what it is in the uh, SYK model. Yeah, okay, and let, in, let, the, yeah. in the black hole, F of tau is a fluctuation of the graviton. Yeah. So if I calculate some spectral form vector, so uh, in, in, in SYK yeah. model, yeah. yeah. So what is the interpretation for various geometries in, in SYK model for calculation of a spectral form vector? So can I have it? Uh, well, that's, that's a whole different topic that I don't really okay, want to go into. Okay, sorry, so that's, yeah. That's, yeah, sorry, yeah. That's what I refer to over here. 
if you want to compute the spectral form factor, you have to take, you know, two SYK models. Uh, and, uh, and then if you, you know, the, there you would have to then look at these wormhole geometries. I mean, the short chain fluctuation give you the initial uh, fall off, but if you want to get the ramp, uh, then you have to include the wormholes. This so, what, yeah, uh, I, I'm uh, asking about, not about gravity calculation, but about just proofers quantum mechanics calculation. If I do that, so... You want to do it directly from the SYK yeah, model? Yeah, SYK, yeah, yeah. Not yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you would end up with the same with the same structure because you can effectively, you know, you can effectively this JT gravity theory uh, is exactly equivalent to the theory that you get from uh, low energy limit of the SYK model, uh, which is this theory here. So this theory here is an exact equivalence between this theory and the JT gravity. So you would end up doing the same calculation provided you accept uh, the reduction to this low energy action. Now, if you want to do it completely in the original SYK model, I think I don't think that's been done, although maybe Alex Arkland and Julian Sonner have some thoughts on that recently. But it's done mostly numerically, yeah. I but, see. Okay. You know, so the, so you know, on the SYK model, there's a, there's a step from here to here. This is approximately equal, okay? <laughs> this is a assumption. This is the low energy limit. But once you accept this, then the, the calculation from this point on is the same as the JT gravity calculation. Okay, thank you. Okay, because it's essentially the same theory. Yeah. Oh, professor, can I have one question? Yes, yeah, please. So, in the SYK model, uh, the randomness is included. So is it an uh, essential thing to, I mean, make a connection to black hole physics or? Uh... Uh, yeah, good question. So let me try to give you my understanding of that. Um, all right, so like I've said for the, uh, you know, so here's uh, some density of states, uh, you know, which is, which is just cinch square root of energy, basically, with some prefactors. Uh, the energy dependence is the same for the SYK model or a black hole. Uh, so, of course, if I want to know every single level, uh, <clears throat> that's a highly chaotic function of the U alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and I have to know the precise random couplings. <laughs> but I'm really only... Uh, <clears throat> interested in some envelope after a little bit of course screening. Uh, and that's easy to do because the energy level spacing is e to the minus 10. So I just have to course screen a tiny amount. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in the cinch function, for example. And to get that, I can just average over those couplings. All right. Now, does that mean that even in a black hole, there are some random couplings? Uh, no, no. I think the black hole probably is described by string theory at very high energies inside. Um, and, uh, but it's a very, very complicated theory, which we can't solve. Uh, and, uh, but in the end, it will have this very chaotic spectrum. And probably even for string theory, it'd be very hard to get every energy level. Uh, but if you want to get every energy level, there's no alternative but solving string theory completely. Uh, we don't know how to do it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but if you're, uh, yeah, so so basically the point is that even systems systems with randomness, the system without randomness can both exhibit chaos. Uh, um, and if you want to know some average properties of chaotic systems, sometimes it's much easier to compute them in a random system. I mean, this is something we do a lot in condensed matter, you know, you, even, uh, you know, if you take a particle in a billiards, it has some chaotic sequence of energy levels. Uh, but if you want to know something about the statistics of those energy levels and level, all kinds of level properties, the easiest way to obtain them is from random matrix theory of uh, Dyson and Meta. Uh, so <laughs> it's the same thing here. Uh, we, are, we, we view the SYK model as some, as a tool to, to 
tease out properties of chaotic systems and the average of a randomness just makes it easier. That's all. Oh, I see. So I mean, there's another way to another way to say this. Another question you can I can ask you. Suppose I take a, you know, if you know about the ADS-CFP duality, there's, uh, let's take, uh, you know, on a finite sphere, a conformal field theory. So if you look at the low energy levels of the conformal field theory, they're just given by operator scaling dimensions. Uh, and those are, you know, spaced by one over the size of the sphere uh, uh, in the energy level. But however, if you go to very high operator scaling dimensions, then there's a very general argument that those very high energy, high, very large operators of a conformal field theory uh, are exponentially dense. Uh, and what those scaling dimensions are, even for something as simple as the Ising model in one, two plus one dimensions, we don't know. There's some very chaotic sequence of energy levels which are exponentially dense, but they're at high energies. Uh, the virtue of the SYK model is it brings these chaotic levels down to zero energy, and then you can yeah. solve it. Uh, but these chaotic levels are present in any, even in something as beautiful and simple as the Ising conformal field theory. They are present at, but at very high, high energies. Yeah. And those are the black hole states. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. Uh, I also have a question. So uh, yes, this is uh, the, uh, now uh, the, it mentioned that it's a relation to black hole, which uh, like a short jump is you now related to this black hole. But uh, this SYK has a lot of like uh, excited states. Like uh, this, yeah, well, like, it has uh, a higher dimension operators, right? I mean, these are the yes. levels here, but uh, they are yeah. higher dimension operators, correct? Yes, then well, the... those higher dimension operators are, those are important for getting this, uh, they affect the pre factor. So, this log n term I was to show you, <laughs> if you really want to understand where this one over n comes from, uh, that is connected in a way to all of those operators. And, and nice. that's roughly why this one over n factor is different between the SYK model uh, and the black hole. So the black hole has this very strange <laughs> number that was obtained recently by Elysium Murthy and Turiachi, uh, this number over here. So that's for this prefactor, uh, or the prefactor, you, the fact that the full uh, spectrum of low lying operators are, is different in in Einstein gravity and in SYK is important, but it's only important for this prefactor. It doesn't affect the other things. Uh -huh. Those uh, actually both are related, to, isn't it related to this matter field in the ABS2? Not only like a black Correct. hole. Correct, yeah. Like... So this it depends upon how many, how many massless fields you have. You know, you have a graviton and a photon. If you had some massless neutrinos, then this factor will change. Correct. So uh, similar, yeah. So the matter content ultimately of a black hole or the SYK model is different. The the spectrum of operators is different. Apart from the Schwarzschild, everything is different. But that it only affects the pre pre factor. It doesn't affect the rest of the the results. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a very yeah. It's mm. yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, right, my so question is, uh, yeah, uh, can I ask one more question? Like, uh, yes, please, well, please. yeah, what I'm thinking is like uh, this, uh, for example, Gross and Rosenhaus uh, talk about uh, this uh, interaction of the this uh, other, like uh, not only that, in, in addition to the Schwarz and you can consider other like a uh, Bayroka mode and then they, co they consider the interaction and uh, of the this uh, some field in the ADS two, so that is like an infinite tower of the some massive mode also appear in the SYK mode. So do you have some like you mentioned that this is, these are contribution from the massless mode, but the... no, no. I mean the, the theory is gapless. Okay, so huh. there are it's not as if there's a gap. I mean uh, so. <laughs> Another, I guess, a subtle point is that the state operator correspondence is uh, breaks down here in ADS two. 
it's a nearly conformal field theory. It's not perfectly conformal. So there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between energy levels uh, and states. Uh, so that's okay. Basically, you get this continuum of states yes. dressing uh, uh, from the Schwarzschild uh, that dominates everything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and all right. So, if you, but if you look in terms of uh, primary operators, not states, if you think in terms of operators, every pair of operators, there are a set of primary operators which have a power law decay in correlations. So, they mm -hmm. have some uh, scaling dimension, H. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's an infinite sequence of them. The smallest one is H equals two. Uh, yes. And then the next one is at, the, I forget, 3.7 or something. And there's a, they're all known. There's just yes. one, sequ one tower of states. For the Majorana SYK model, there's only one tower. That's it. Mm -hmm. There's an infinite set of primary operators and they all have irrational scaling dimension except the yes. lowest one, which is H equals two. Yes. Yeah, so those are the, that's the spectrum of operators. Yes. And I'm saying that, that whole spectrum of operators comes into determining uh, the one over n free factor in the density of states. Nice. That one also. So, so there's no one to one. Because, yeah, it's it's not like higher dimensional conformal field theory for every operator. There's a state and there's a gap or something. It's not like that. There is no gap. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sabir, can you perhaps finish in like ten minutes? Yes, thank you. Yeah. We, so, we don't want to torture I, you uh, by like having no, no, you like- I've enjoyed yeah. it. I'm getting a lot of very good questions. So everyone is awake. So that's great. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, great questions. Thank you for the discussion. All right, so now I want to return to the original motivation for uh, studying the SYK model and I'll be a little bit rapid here. Uh, you know, the SYK model was toy model of a strange metal, but uh, to my good fortune and surprise, it's been much more than a toy model for black holes, uh, but it's still pretty much a toy model for strange metals and we have to improve it. So now we have learned a lot. And so we want to improve the toy model to describe a real material. So this is recent work over the last year or two with uh, Avish Patel, who's now a postdoc at Flatiron. How you go is a current student at Harvard and Ilya Estes. And uh, okay. All right, so I already mentioned this property of uh, strange metal that resistance is a linear function of temperature. Uh, but there are other properties which are also quite universal, uh, at least among the cube phrase. The specific heat causes T log T. The optical conductivity is characterized by a transport time, transport rate, which is a linear function of frequency or temperature. And then even the self energies are also linear functions of frequency or temperature. So we'd like to get all of these properties coming out of some theory. Uh, and the entropy vanishes as the specific heat is just T log T. Okay. All right. So the correct, after some lot of struggle over the years, uh, we, we think the best way to get something more realistic from a toy model is not start with the SIK model. Uh, but start from what now people are calling the Yukawa SYK model. So this is very similar to the SYK model, except you have both fermions and bosons. So you have some fermion phi psi and a boson phi. And now on their own, they have essentially no dynamics. Just the bosons have the same frequency omega zero, uh, and there's some chemical potential for the fermions. But then there's a Yukawa coupling GIJL and you make this a random function of its indices. So this can also be solved by exactly the same methods and every, the whole song and dance I told you about the SYK model pretty much applies to this model. You know, Some of the numbers are a bit different, but it's the same basic structure. There's a short chain effective action. There's a zero temperature entropy and all of that. Okay, so we're gonna start from this model, but now put in you know, there's no space here. We're going to put in some spatial structure and we're going to put in some dispersion for the fermions and, and so on. And then hopefully it's going to describe something realistic. So it's specifically like, you know, imagine that you have some Fermi surface uh, and that's undergoes a phase transition defined by this Ising order parameter phi where the Fermi surface distorts 
either in this direction or that direction as some critical coupling J. And at finite temperature, then you expect this quantum critical region with Planckian time dynamics, which is all correct. But perhaps this is a strange metal. Uh, and that's been the hope of many of us over the last few decades to try to understand this region better uh, and its, uh, its observable properties. Okay, so so the what yeah let me skip that so what kind of theory would do well you start out with the fermi surface for the fermions so now there's a dispersion unlike the dispersionless uh, term in the SYK model with then this e of k vanishes on a fermi surface then you might imagine that you had some coupling between the fermions uh, but because we want to be near a phase transition we decouple this uh, by hubbard schrodinger transformation, and that's the origin of a boson. And now we take this theory and, and figure out what's going to happen uh, near the critical point, where, near this phase transition where the mass of phi vanishes. Uh, now, it turns out that doesn't work. And so there's a long story behind that, which I certainly don't have time to tell you. There's a whole talk about how this does not give you a strange metal, despite many people have claim, having claimed that it does. Uh, it does not. Now everyone, I think, agrees with that. Uh, and it has to do with the importance of drag effects. Uh, the, you know, the fermions and bosons are not really independent degrees of freedom. And so just because the fermion is scattering very strongly from the boson doesn't mean that that implies any degradation of electrical currents. Uh, okay, so you have to put in some impurities. So the simplest thing you can put in is uh, V of R, some random potential. Uh, that also doesn't do the trick. So then you ask, well, maybe you can put in some randomness in the coupling J. Uh, and by rescaling phi, you can write it this way. So now this is our final model, which actually does the trick. Uh, you have fermions with the dispersion. You have a Yukawa coupling, which is both spatially uniform and spatially random. And then you also have some random potential. Okay, so this kind of theory in finite space uh, with, you know, very generic theory. Now you solve this theory using the SYK kind of technology. Uh, that is, you write down some Green's function of self-energy, some G sigma action, you take a saddle point and, and do all of that. Then you take a large end limit by giving everything a flavor index. So all of those steps I will skip. Uh, and then, you know, well, sorry, before I go there. So what's the origin of this G prime? Well, there's plenty of evidence in the experiments that there's random couplings. For example, this gap maps show you that uh, there's 100% fluctuation in the size of the superconducting gap, uh, so telling you that the coupling to between the electron and the pairing glue must be random in space. Uh, all right. So we take this theory here, we apply the term, the SYK crank, uh, you get some G sigma theory, you take it, set. now there's, a, you know, not just space, these are not just bilocal in, in time, they are bilocal in space and time. That's really the only difference. Uh, and then you take saddle part equations, some of which are break translational symmetry, some which don't. You solve these equations, uh, and then you compute the response to external electric field and you get the conductivity. All right, I'm just going to skip ahead and give you the basic answer. So you do all of that, which has been done with my, you know, actually done by Avishkar and Ayu and Ilya in great detail, also numerically. So this is what you get. In fact, you get all the four properties I mentioned. Uh, you get uh, transport rate going linear in frequency or temperature. Uh, and also similarly for the self-energy. But one very important point is that the linear T resistivity comes from the random couplings. So without randomness, there is no strange metal. Uh, whereas the, self the inelastic scattering rate of the electrons comes from both G squared and G prime squared, both the random and non-random components. Okay, so that's the end. So just to summarize, uh, the SYK is a toy model without particle-like excitations, exhibiting thermalization and many-body chaos. 
in the Planckian time. Uh, that already is exciting enough, and some of this we knew for a long time, and now we've learned many more details uh, of its spectrum uh, down at low energies. Uh, and amazingly, this spectrum that you get from the SYK model is in fact the universal low energy spectrum apart from a prefactor, but the energy dependence is exactly the same that what you would expect in a generic charred black hole. Uh, and uh, this had not been known until uh, all the work using the SYK model. Uh, what the form of the corrections to the Bekenstein Hawking entropy was generically. Uh, and then applying it to strange metal and to this model with random couplings, spatially random couplings, uh, we have a relatively simple model which gives you the basic properties of strange metals. Uh, and we are now trying to extend this in various directions and uh, really sharpen the uh, the confrontation between theory and experiment. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so the session is open for the questions and comments. So let's start with the Bhattara, uh, Sumdata uh, Bhattara, yeah. Yeah, so but my, are, yeah. yes, <laughs> sorry, yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the uh, what would you say is the origin of the scalar in the Yukawa SYK model? I mean, uh, well, it depends on the physical system. You're how looking. would you motivate so, that? Yes, so you know, if you have a a particular system, and uh, Nick Tides is an example. We are actually undergoing this phase transition. Suppose you are, your strange metal is near such a phase transition between this and this, uh, where you're going from a tetragonal shape to orthorhombic shape. This is, you know, this could happen. I mean, in Nikta, there's some evidence for this. Uh, then in this case, phi is just some uh, scalar field which measures the eccentricity or, or the rectangularness of the Fermi surface. This, size in this direction minus the size in that direction. Uh, so that's one possible scalar field. Uh, there could be, you know, it could be that you're near a spin density wave transition, in which case phi would be the spin density wave order parameter or a charge density wave transition. Uh, you could also be something more exotic. It could be related to some kind of Higgs field uh, that takes you from a fractionalized phase to a non-fractionalized phase. Basically, the remarkable thing is for all of these cases, the, the theory in the end is the same. Uh, it's the theory that I've just described. Uh, you have many different physical interpretations in different materials, uh, but you end up with this same theory over here, this one. Uh, and, uh, and that's actually, I claim, is a good thing because the strange metal is kind of a universal phenomenon seen in so many different strongly correlated materials. Uh, and so it calls for some very simple general theory, and this is what we claim it is. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, let's move to Hanai, Ryo Hanai. Ah, uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, so for the latter part, like for the, in the Yukawa SYK model, um, so I, I just wanted to know the what's the minim, minimum ingredients you need to get the linear scaling so do you need for example the disorder in the potential VR? no starters so the disorder in v so the minimal thing to first answer your question is just g prime that's all you need you okay, can put so g equals zero you can put v equals zero you will get a linear t resistivity now why do i need v well v gives you the residual resistivity so if you look here the transport time, uh, just replace frequency by temperature. Then uh, the resistance at zero temperature is determined by V. The slope of the resistivity with temperature is determined by G prime. This is a very general, and, and G actually cancels out. So this, this was the thing that, you know, was the stumbling blocks, took us uh, one or two years of work. You know, everyone had been studying the G. And mm -hmm. when you carefully do the transport from the G, you find it cancels out of transport. So you have to then put the G prime uh, and the V. But the G, 
So the important thing is G cancels out of transport, but doesn't cancel out of uh, single particle properties. Yeah. So how about uh, that, uh, what's the role of the yeah. dispersion? Does it um for the trend? I believe that you can, in principle, calculate the conductivity without. I mean, with the all to all couple, the usual S Y K model. No, no, no. We're not doing. Yeah. No, this is not the model. We're not doing that here. I mean, we have done that in different papers. Here, yeah. there is a dispersion. Yeah, 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 yeah. I understand it, but was that necessary in terms of getting the linear dispersion? I'm yes, sorry, yes, linear, uh, linear resistivity. Conductivity. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the, there's a dispersion, and then when you evaluate all these things, mm -hmm. uh, there's various factors of the density of states at the Fermi level that I have not written down. Uh, yeah, no, no. The, the this dispersion is definitely important, uh, mm -hmm. and the, the form, the detailed form of the dispersion, uh, will determine various coefficients here that I haven't written down. This, this is just very schematic expressions. Everything is one, but there are various coefficients here and factors of pi uh, and dependence on the Fermi velocity and all of that. Yeah. I see. Great, thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, next is Su Chang. Uh, Hi. Thank you for the very nice talk. And so I have a few questions. So here in this model, if you consider superconductivity, I mean, then, uh, I mean, usually uh, a disorder, I mean, this uh, suppress the D wave superconductivity. So do you, uh, what do you expect for superconductivity? Uh, though this model will have superconductivity, uh, you know, you have to put in the spin indices here, but it, even the G prime, you know, as long as G prime is relatively long wavelength, uh, then the dominant processes are just uh, anti-nodal points on the Fermi surface. Uh, in fact, when you average over G prime, that's what you get. Uh, and and so yeah, you can, any this is this will in fact induce odd, even parity superconductivity. Uh, whether it's S wave or D wave, that depends on uh, other interactions, not the critical theory. So in fact, this theory, the ground state ultimately is a superconductor, uh, and we are studying that right now. Yeah. So it's perfectly compared. So this gives you actually the first example of a theory that you can go from a strange metal to a superconductor. This is a theory of that transition. Uh, and I have one more question. So here, can I think the state of boson, I mean, state of boson as uh, some uh, rare region or maybe some kind of spin glass space? Or I mean, since... Uh, not in our theory so far, not in the strange uh -huh. metal. Now, it could be that if we really took this theory very seriously and really studied the effect of uh, random, all of all forms of randomness beyond our mean field self consistent approach, uh, that there will be some spin glass order. It's possible. Yeah, we haven't. But at these temp, we imagine we have some temperatures that are relatively high where we could use a kind of an average theory, but. Because you're in finite dimension, there is a possibility of some glassy behavior at very low temperatures. Uh, so that's something you know we hope to study in the future. Yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you. Okay, next is Anak Lu and then Chong and then Parchi. Yeah. So Anak Lu, yeah. Uh-huh. So this is more of a definitional question. But with regards to this, these sort of like hertz millis theories of quantum criticality, are we always guaranteed yeah. to get or observe like T-linear resistivity? Or can we get some well, other... Well, so this is a... Well, the hertz millis theory was this theory here, if you wish, without, before I put in the disorder. This is the hertz millis theory, essentially. Uh, and uh, this theory actually has zero resistance. Uh, if you look at at least a singular part of it, I mean, there's some background resistivity, but uh, coming from high momentum processes. But uh, because of the, so the point here is, yeah, this is the key point actually. Uh, uh, you know, you know, I said that people thought, well, maybe there's a strange metal here. In fact, in the pure system without disorder, there isn't. And the reason is uh, is uh, drag. So what happens is that 
you know, Hertzmuller's theory or for this theory, you get a very strong scattering of the fermions of the phi. And that leads to the fermions having an omega to the two thirds self energy and breakdown of quasi particles, all of which is correct. But you are scattering, even though their scattering is very strong, you could still have essentially zero resistance. Uh, and that's because of conservation of momentum. You know, the point here is your, the fermions are scattering off the boson and they're giving their momentum to the boson. But because they're so strongly coupled, there's really no difference from between the fermions and the boson. <laughs> there's just some quantum critical soup and the momentum is really not relaxing. It's part of the same set of strongly coupled excitations. So the whole soup will just flow in the presence of an electric field and the resistance is zero. So Hertzmiller's theory has zero resistance basically to, to leading order. And, and, and many papers in literature are simply incorrect because they ignore these drag effects. And why? Well, I think because, you know, in phonons, you can get away with ignoring graphic effects because the electron phonon coupling is weak. But here, the coupling is so strong, especially in two dimensions, uh, you can't ignore drag. And you have to really do a full, uh, self consistent computation, which SYK pretty much demands that you do, uh, to understand transport properly. Um, so you find that the resistance is zero. There's essentially negligible optical conductivity in Hertzmiller's theory. It's only when you modify Hertzmiller's theory by putting in the G prime, which is a function of position. Uh, that's our innovation. Uh, then you get linear two resistivity. Thank you. And actually, a quick related question to that is that idea that has zero, uh, this pure Hertzmiller's theory has zero resistance. Can we understand that via recent work with, that used the anomaly of the Fermi surface to show that this connectivity is essentially a Drude peak? Is that the same phenomenon? Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Hmm. So the anomaly argument, which is the, you referred to the recent paper of Xi et al., right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's really for the optical conductivity with omega to the two thirds. Uh, the, what I'm referring to is the DC resistivity of having a delta function. Uh, no, so that you don't need anything very fancy. You, you, you know, memory function approach gives it to you right away. Uh, and, uh, uh, or you can see from holography or you can just see it from, uh, equations of motion. Uh, so that's quite simple. Now there's some, Right. Uh, now there, there's some further discussion of what happened to the optical conductivity. And there are arguments using anomalies, uh, that were made for auto parameters that are parity odd. Uh, but they don't say anything for parity even order parameters. Our work is for parity even and the uh, anomaly arguments don't say anything, but we have somewhat different arguments showing that omega to the minus two thirds, uh, coefficient vanishes. Uh, what the relationship is between our approach and their approach is still not clear. I would say the anomaly argument has this feature that it focuses on independent points on the Fermi surface. And we don't think that's correct. So, but let's see, that's uh, something that still needs to be sorted out. In any case, all of these subtleties are for the non-random case. <laughs> Once you put in these randomness G prime and V, we don't have to worry about any of that. Thank you. Hey, uh, okay, thank you very much for the fascinating talk. So my question is about, you know, what kind of restriction you, may ha you might have on say, things like symmetry of the your critical boson, because here you, you discussed the case where you have random coupling between this boson and the fermion density. But suppose you have a uh, boson coupling to say current or spin current of the fermion. I mean, would you expect the same result or how would, it, how would your result change? Oh, uh, in the clean case, many things change, but in the random case, once you make this a functional position, uh, I don't think it will change. It is pretty much the same for all of those cases. Yeah. Once you make okay. G prime of, yeah. So okay. yeah, in the clean case, you know, there's different cases and, uh, uh, there's Z equals two, Z equals three, and different behaviors that people have studied over the years. Uh, 
but once you make this uh, G prime random, uh, then they're all the same. And in fact, in the end, you get the boson has a diffusive propagator. Uh, that's something that always comes out and then everything, all the results that follow from that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very uh, much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Random things <laughs> okay. make life simple. That is that is the uh, one lesson from my talk, which has been <laughs> uh, both in the SYK model, black holes and strange metals. Randomness is what you want to make life simple. Even if, it's, yeah, for the black, I'm not saying black holes have randomness, but it gives you a simpler theory if you use it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, I guess next is yeah. that's a very nice uh, summary. Yeah, Saya Patrici, yeah. That's oh. the last thing, uh, question. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, so in the original SYK model, you were describing uh, fermion processes, which were two fermions going to two fermion states. So my question yeah. is, why is that number significant? And does that is there any physical interpretation of why this particular model gave you the black hole theory where you had two fermions going to two fermions? Uh, no, you could take, as far as black holes are concerned, you could take three fermions going to three fermions, any of them. Uh, you will get very similar properties. I mean, I think this, uh, I have to think a little bit. I'm pretty sure all of this is universal. It holds for all of them. To take care of I mean, the value of S0 would be different. The value of gamma would be different. But gamma just depends on the couplings anyway. It's not universal. I think this will be the same. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. So the cinch square root of E is, uh, is, it's like a very robust thing. All of those models will have the cinch. The only exception is the, uh, is the random matrix model where you just have one fermion going to one fermion. That doesn't work. But two to two, three to three, so on, they all give you uh, the same the same result. And what's important, if you have a mixture, what's important is the smallest one. So suppose you have two terms, one is two to two and the other is three to three, uh, then the value of S naught is just determined by two to two. The three to three won't matter. I see, interesting. Okay, thank you for your talk. Sure. Hey, uh... Pradita Sankar Fata, could you make it very short? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when you derive the entropy of the Hawking radiation from the model, you talk about that S at, S at t is equal to zero. So what is that t? Is it the uh, Hawking temperature that you are talking about? Yeah, that's the extremal limit, basically, if you want. If you mean here? Uh, yeah. So the t tending yeah, to. So, so there is. Right, so there's two two different ways to think about it. A gravitational person would say there's some mass m and a charge q in the black hole. Now, you know, the mass m is attractive. Gravity force is attractive, wants to, uh, and the charge q is repulsive. So if you keep adding charge while keeping the mass fixed, eventually a black hole will explode. So there's a limiting case where just before it's about to explode, uh, and that's like the zero temperature limit. So it's like thermodynamics. You know, you, if you do thermodynamics in one ensemble, you think of M and Q as the independent variables. Here I'm doing thermodynamics in different ensemble where I'm thinking of T and Q as the independent variables. Yeah. Okay. So it is the case for only for the extremal black holes. Uh, yeah, all I'm saying is that uh, T goes to zero limit is exactly the same as saying it's an extremal limit. They're the same thing. Okay. And one more thing, like, I'll go in very short. So you said that in the de the density of states are uh, uh, spaced exponentially large. So, but in the string theory limit, we know that uh, after that, at that uh, after the delta separation from the ground state, we have very densely separated states now. Uh, I am confused yes. that is it. You only uh, know that recently it was shown by these people that this this part here. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. So uh, aren't these two statements like uh, contradicting or maybe I'm missing out something. So if I am saying that near to the ground state, something is very densely populated and then I'm somewhat saying that after the energy band gap delta, it is 
densely populated. So, how are these statements related? Maybe? Okay, so it's a question of supersymmetry. So now, and low energy supersymmetry. So, uh, you know, at very high energies, probably <coughs> theory is right. And let's assume, and there's high energy supersymmetry. Now, these string theory calculations assume there's supersymmetry down to low energies. If you assume that, then you will get the delta function. However, if you assume that supersymmetry is broken down to low energy, which is the real situation in our universe, then you're going to get this answer. Actually, that's also true for the SYK model, and this is what we showed some work. If you, you, there's a supersymmetric version of the SYK model. If you solve the non-supersymmetric SYK model, you get this. If you take mm -hmm. the SYK model with supersymmetry, you get this. Okay. The important difference is if you look at the low energy limit uh, in all of these cases, including the string theory, here you have the low energy theory is the Schwarzschild theory. Here the low energy theory is the super Schwarzschild theory. And if you do the path integral of the super Schwarzschild theory, you get this structure. Okay. So this okay. delta function, this, you know, everything in these computations of Stramunja and Wafa and everything and following is all built on supersymmetry. Without supersymmetry, you do not, do not get this. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, then I, I think it's now time to thank uh, Professor Sivir Sachdev for the two hours lectures and the discussions, which we greatly appreciate. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sachdev.